This is Ronald Coleman inviting you to radio's most dramatic half hour, Favorite Story. The man named Anton Chekhov was a great playwright. The Russian Shakespeare, they called him, and a master of the short story. He was a gentle soul with an unusual understanding of the heart of man. And in this week's favorite story, you'll find he proves himself a great searcher after truth. Charles Boyer selected Chekhov's The Bet as his favorite. Claude Sweeten has added the unusual instrument called the theremin to his orchestra, and John Beale and William Conrad are our leading players. Here's act one of The Bet. There is a yellow square of light in the corner of the garden. It is the window of a gardener's cottage, woven across with vines which show black against the square of light like veins in the hand of an old woman. There is no moon. The garden looks like a jungle in the starlight. It wasn't always so, for there was a time when this estate had gardeners to care for these grounds. But there are no gardeners now. So the vines and plants and shrubs have overgrown each other and covered the little cottage, all four walls. Even the door is laced across with intertwining vines. Yet, there is a light inside. There is a candle burning inside that garden cottage. And there must be someone there who lit the candle. We can't see him. The window is too high up on the wall of the hut. But he is there. No one has seen him for 15 years. But he is there. Tonight, the owner of this estate, the man named Stakovich, will call on that man in the cottage to kill him. Fifteen years ago tonight, it was different. There was laughter in this house. <laughs> that is a very amusing point of view, Sergei. I don't think it's an amusing subject. Well, our young lawyer speaks. Tell us, Simeon, why is it not an amusing subject? To take a man's life? That's, that's murder. Well, for the individual to do such a thing, yes. For the individual private citizen. But for the state to take a man's life, that is another matter. Now, are you going to try to tell us that when a criminal is convicted in a fair trial by a court of justice and is ordered to be hung by the Tsar's executioners... That that is murder? The state is not God, Stakovich. It has no right to take away something that, that it can't give back. And for that reason, I insist that it's wrong for the state to take away a man's life. So, my friend, you would allow murderers to wander in the streets unmolested? Well, there are prisons. True, true. But is not the prison a means of taking away life? The result is the same. Execution kills instantly. Imprisonment kills by degrees. Now, who is the more humane executioner? One who kills you in a few seconds, or one who draws the life out of you incessantly for years? Well, then they're both wrong. But if I were offered my choice between capital punishment and life imprisonment, I would certainly choose the prison. For it's better to live somehow than not to live at all. Is life so priceless? A thousand men take their own lives every day. Well, then they're fools. Perhaps not. You see, Simeon, I am a very wealthy man. If you were to ask me how many millions I am worth, I could not tell you. Everything which has meaning in my life has been purchased by these millions. My houses, my wardrobe, my carriages, my stables, the good food and drink you've enjoyed with me tonight. Now, take away my fortune, and I would as soon you took away my life as well. I'm sorry for you. <laughs> Your empty talk about life in a prison. Now tell me, can you imagine what it's like? The dismal, dreary days, the nights without end, the gray walls blending into the gray earth and the gray sky. You would prefer such a life to the repose of the grave? You speak as one who has seen the inside of a prison. And you speak as one who has neither manners nor common sense. Sorry. I'll tell you what I'll do. I will bet two million rubles that you could not endure even five years in a prison cell. Are you serious? Perfectly. If you mean this, seriously... I'll bet that I can stay in the confinement of a prison, not five years, but fifteen. Fifteen? Yes. Done. I stake two millions, you stake your freedom. Stakovich, this is absurd, this is insanity. It's agreed. You stake two million rubles, I my freedom. If I remain confined in one room, a cell... Completely alone, no one to see, no one to talk with. In solitary confinement, then for fifteen years, you will pay me two millions, is that correct? That's correct. The most ridiculous bet I ever heard. Well, we're both gentlemen of honor. There's no need to put this in writing. Sergei is our witness. I want no part of this matter. All right, now, here is how we do it. There is a brick hut at the foot of my garden. A 
a one-room cottage where we keep some of the gardening tools. Now, this will be your prison. Agreed. You will be under strict observation. The door will not be locked. But if you so much as set one foot past the threshold, you shall have lost the bet. Gentlemen, you cannot mean to go through with this. Wait, I must have books, pen and ink, writing paper. All right, all right. You may write letters, but you may not receive any in reply. No letters, no newspapers. You are not to see any living people. You are not to hear a human voice. The terms are not so harsh in a prison. However, he may have any books he wishes. Uh, whatever food he likes. Uh, uh, a musical instrument, perhaps. A piano. I should like a piano. Granted. And, but if, 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 if I can speak with no one, how shall I make my wishes known? Uh, yes, I believe there is one window in the hut. Yes, uh, high up on the garden side. Now, you will write a note with your requests. Leave it on the windowsill. The books you want, the food you wish, these will be left for you by my servants on the same windowsill. When shall this begin? Whenever you say. As soon as possible. Midnight tomorrow night, the 19th of May. And at midnight on the 19th of May, 15 years hence, you will pay me two million rubles. If you remain in confinement, which of course you will not. Gentlemen, come to your senses. This is a joke, my friends. Let it pass as such. No. I have made an agreement. I intend to abide by it. <laughs> no, seriously, Semyon Sergei is right. This is foolishness. Two millions is nothing to me, but you stand to lose three or four years of your life. Now, I say three or four because you'll never stick it out any longer. And don't forget, young fellow, that voluntary imprisonment is much harder to endure than forced imprisonment. You will be your own jailer. A simple muscular movement, a few footsteps, and you can be as free as any other man. Now, are you foolish enough to think that you could keep this bargain, even for two million rubles? I shall be at the gardener's cottage ten minutes before midnight tomorrow, according to the terms of the bet. Why did I make this bet? What is the good? My young friend loses 15 years of his life and I throw away two millions. For what? Will it convince people that the gallows are any worse or better than imprisonment? No. No, it's all foolishness. On my part, it was the cruel joke of a well-fed man. On the part of my young friend, well, greed, I suppose. Greed for two million rubles. Why did I make this bet? Well, the answer is simple. Is there anything a man in my position would not do for two million rubles? But no, it's, it's not the money alone. It's not the promise of wealth and complete independence when I'm free again. It was a challenge that was beyond my power to refuse. Something enormous, something irresistible forced me to accept this bet. The time, Sergei? Three minutes until midnight. Three minutes to live, Simeon. To see stars overhead, to smell the wind fresh off the meadow. Three minutes and you go to your death. A slow, tortuous death in life. That little hut is going to be your grave, my young friend. But an open grave that you can leave any time and rejoin the living. You think you will refuse? You think you have the faintest chance of winning this bet? The time. Two minutes before midnight. Simeon. Consider, I, I am not pleading with you because I wish to save paying you two millions. That is only two grains in the sands of my fortune. But I cannot bear to be the instrument of this useless gesture. Simeon, how old are you? Thirty? Twenty-eight? Or twenty-nine, more likely. Fifteen years from tonight, when you come out through that door, you will be past forty. And you will look... How do you think you will look, my friend? One minute? Less than that. Wait! Simeon, I, I cannot let you do this thing. You are young and foolish, but you are my friend. If it's money you need, I will give you 20,000 rubles. 20,000, and we will forget this foolish bet, huh? 30,000. 30,000, if you will not go through that door. I, I cannot have it on my conscience. 30,000. 40. 50. 
Sí. Estás un loco. When the door closes behind him and he looks at the four walls which will close him in day and night, night and day for 15 years. What does a man think about when the door closes behind him? Ready for Act Two of Charles Boyer's favorite story, The Bet, by Anton Chekhov. Dramatized and directed by Jerome Lawrence and Robert E. Lee, and starring John Beale and William Conrad. What does a man think about when a prison door closes behind him? When he sees the four walls, which will be the boundary of his world for 15 years, what does he think? Ivanov heard the door close, the latch snap, and then he felt nothing but numbness. He had sentenced himself. He had undertaken this fearful confinement as a bet. If he could last out 15 years, it would bring him two million rubles. Two million rubles. What is two million rubles? He blew out his candle and felt his way along the brick wall to his bed. Fully clothed, he lay down and immediately fell asleep. I awoke with a start. Daylight. I didn't know where I was. And then I remembered and began to take stock of my surroundings. A straw-filled mattress, a chair, a table, a bucket of water, and a piano. I'd never had time to learn to play. I could study now. Now I would have time to learn. I would send for a manual of the piano. I would teach myself. I placed a note high up on the window ledge and waited. Shortly, it was drawn out of my sight by an unseen hand. And in due time, some food and a book appeared on a tray there on my windowsill. And I ate and then began practicing the chords and scales in the piano manual. And I was terrified. The square of sunlight from my window had, had scarcely moved. With all that had happened, my note, the breakfast, my clumsy fingering of the piano, less than an hour had passed. Since I awoke, that patch of sunlight had moved less than six inches. That morning was the longest morning of my life. <laughs> And what do you hear from your guest at the bottom of the garden, Stokovich? Does he seem contented? Here. Read his notes. Ah. My dear jailer, please send me coffee and gruel and a manual for the study of the pianoforte. That was his first note two weeks ago. You complied? At once. Read some more. My dear jailer, make me laugh. Send me a book which will make me laugh. How pitiful. Yes. Read this. He sent it an hour ago. I beg of you, dear jailer, when the servant brings my coffee tomorrow, let him say good morning. I must hear the sound of a human voice. Well, Stakovich, what will you do? The prisoner will be served in silence. Those were the terms of the bet. tray in my window. Say something. Speak to me. Say, here is your breakfast, Semyon Ivanov. Or just say, God be with you. Is that too much to ask? Curse, curse me then. 
Only let me hear the sound of a human voice. I can hear a human voice. I can hear all the human voices I like. I have only to go to the door, touch the latch, step outside, and I'm as free as other men. I will. My fingers reached the latch, but I did not go out the door. Something stopped me. I went back to my piano. Hour after hour, for days and months on end, I sat at my piano keyboard until I knew I was master of the instrument. I sent for books till they were stacked to the ceiling of my cell. The great writing of all time. The philosophers, Aristotle, Socrates, Confucius. In the second year, I read 600 volumes. In the third year, I approached the realm of the natural sciences, chemistry, biology, astronomy. I set about the study of languages, Latin, Greek, French, German, even Sanskrit, and Aramaic, and early Egyptian. These studies occupied seven years of my confinement, so that no season which passed seemed half so long as that first morning in the gardener's cottage. Oh, Sergei, I'm very glad to see you. I came as quickly as I could, are you will? What is wrong? At a time such as this, a man needs someone to talk with. My friend, since sunrise this morning, I have lost 50 million rubles. 50 million rubles? How did it happen? How? Small loss, I try to recover it with a larger investment, I lose again, double the stakes, and so on. Did you lose everything? No. No, Sergei, I have a few millions remaining. What about the bet? I can't afford to lose it now. I can only hope that my visitor at the foot of the garden will choose to escape before the 15th year. Either to escape or to die. These events were not known to me, only guessed at. My books came in cheaper bindings. The food was plain now. I could see the vines growing wild across my little square of sky. I became terribly depressed. My tenth year in that prison cell was a nightmare. My mind refused to grasp. My eyes refused to read. My tongue to taste. And my legs ached to walk a long distance. And then one day... I found on my windowsill a book I hadn't requested. The Holy Bible. For two years, he has read nothing else. You still supply whatever he asks for? I place everything on his windowsill myself. What of your servants? I no longer keep any servants, Sergei. Things have gone very badly with me on the exchange. Still more losses. And... If you lose the bet. I'm still a gentleman, a man of honor. I've given my word and I shall keep it. By selling all my property, even my clothing, I I shall be able to raise two million rubles. There is the square of yellow light. Crisscrossed with vines, like veins in the hand of an old woman. An hour from now it will be midnight, and he will have won the bet. An hour from now he will have two million rubles, and I will have the coat on my back. That is all. There is nothing left. The man must die. Is 
Semyon. Semyon. Gone. He's gone. No, my friend. I'm here at the piano. Put away your gun. It's not yet midnight. You haven't lost the bet. Not yet. Semyon, I must tell you, I do not intend to lose it. There is something I must say to you before this business is concluded. What music is appropriate? What shall I play? The dance macabre? In a few moments, unless you choose to put a bullet through my head, I shall be a millionaire twice over and a free man after 15 years in a solitary cell. These 15 years, I have studied earthly life. In your books, I have spanned continents, sung songs, hunted deer in the forests. Through the magic of your poets, beautiful women, like clouds, ethereal, have whispered wonderful tales to me that made my head spin. I have climbed to the summit of Mont Blanc and seen the sun rise and watched it turn the rim of the ocean red at twilight. I saw from there how lightning cleaved the clouds. I saw green forests, fields, rivers, lakes, cities. In your books, I cast myself into the emptiness of space, worked miracles, preached new religions, all inside this prison cell. The sum total of human thought is compressed into a little lump in my skull. And I despise your way of life. Everything in your existence is void, frail, a mirage. You have taken falsehood for truth, ugliness for beauty. As I read your books, I am appalled at how you could have traded heaven for earth. And to show you my contempt for what you live by, I hereby give up my claim to the two million rubles. I give up this fortune, which I once considered paradise, by leaving this cell at five minutes before midnight. Isn't that the time now? Yes. Yes, five minutes before midnight. Then I shall wish you good night, my dear Jane. And may God be with you. I brushed by him on the path. Yes. But it is not yet midnight. You are saved. You're still a rich man. Laugh, my friend. You've won the bet. I... I I'm not sure, Sergei. Whether... I've won or lost. you have the answer. Did the man named Stakovich win or lose? At any rate, the bet is a great story. Our thanks to John Beale and William Conrad for their performances, to Claude Sweeten and Dr. Samuel Hoffman, who supplied the unusual music, and to Charles Boyer, who chose Chekhov's moving yarn as his favorite story. Next week, we're presenting an old American favorite, probably the most popular one-act play ever written, the Valiant. You probably played in it yourself at high school or college. And it's the particular selection of one of America's favorite personalities, Bob Hope. We have an unusual cast in this moving story of a condemned man. We hope you'll be listening.